And I'm going to start today by asking a question. Have you ever had a financial opportunity that did not turn out well? Raise it. Okay. Everybody has a story when it comes to money. We all have a money story. Money tells a lot about us. What gets us excited? What frustrates us? What causes us a lot of worry? It's a real interesting thing about money. If you want to know what someone really values, what someone really hopes for, what someone's real priorities are, way better than asking them is just look at how they handle their money. Because money is the way in our culture we ultimately express what we really believe and what we really value. Jesus himself said where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart's going to go. So I'm quoting Jesus, not an American televangelist. So God knows all about it. And if I were to ask, just in generalities, you know, what's your ultimate commitment in life? I think most Christians would probably say what they're prepped to say, well, it's God. But the real interesting question would be, would the way I handle my money confirm what my mouth is saying? Uh, So we're looking this weekend at one of the most amazing statements in the Bible, often misused and misquoted, and I'm going to do my real best to be simple, just real simple. This is Malachi chapter 3. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my principles and haven't kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. But you ask, well, how are we to return? God says, will a mere mortal rob God? But you rob me. But you say, well, how are we robbing you? God says in tithes and offerings. They're not the same. Tithes, conjunction, and offerings. Just want to help us understand it. He says, you're under a curse because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there will be provision in my house. Test me in this. And I'm going to close with that one, so hold on says the Lord Almighty, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much blessing, there's not room to contain it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops, and I'll cause your vines not to drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed. Not you calling you blessed. Other people are going to say, boy, they're blessed. They really are blessed. God wants the pagans to call you blessed, not broke. <laughs> okay. I know. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Our God is a generous God. He wants human beings to be generous like Him. We're His kids. He wants us to be like Daddy. So the fundamental concrete practice He gave to Israel and to the human race to train us. You train your children potty train. You train them how to brush their teeth. You train them how to tie their shoes. God says, I want to train you in generosity. And he called it tithing. Now, if you grew up around the church, you probably know something about tithing. Uh, I'm grateful we have so many generous people in our church. And many of you have practiced tithing for a long time. I've been doing that since I was 18. I actually did that before I was a Christian. Here's an interesting thing about principles, whether it's marriage or money or, rela- or anything or friendship. If you do what God says, you get the same result. So it doesn't get you to heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. But there are guys who aren't going to heaven who have a better marriage than you who are going to heaven because they just happen to be doing what God told them to do and honoring the wife as the weaker vessel, tr- treating her in an understanding way, submitting one to another, and on and on it goes. Well, they do that don't even know God's word, and they get a good result from it. It'll get them a happy marriage. It won't get them into heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. I have to say this because of the religious people. So I want you to put heaven aside for a moment. That's Jesus only. You got nothing to do with that. He did it all. But when it comes to a good marriage, you are responsible. When it comes to handling your money, you are responsible. There ain't no angel writing checks out of your checkbook. You are. And so God says, I'm going to give you some options here about how to live in the kingdom so that I can take care of you and make sure you don't live in poverty. So I've designed this message real simple for people who are brand new to that concept of tithing and who perhaps have never tried that before. And I'm going to 
I'm going to teach it. I'm going to, let's just call it the tithe challenge. Or remember school, particularly college, uh, tithing 101. I remember economics 101, banking and finance 101, University of South Carolina. That's the ground level elementary school and principles. So like we go to a marriage seminar, we're going to one right now to see how does God want to do business with us? So here's the question number one. What exactly is tithing? Tithing comes from a Hebrew word that means the tenth part, 10%. The practice of tithing is giving 10% of my earnings to God. I mention it because a lot of people use the word tithing rather loosely. Somebody might say, I think I'll tithe $10. Well, in case you're a little math challenged, if $10 were a literal tithe, that would mean your salary was only $100 because tithe is 10%. That's what tithe means. Now, that's pretty easy, isn't it? You don't have to agree uh, with anything, but based on the Hebrew language, tithe means 10%, the 10th part. Give me a little encouragement here. I mean, it's simple. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you in just a minute. Hold on. Number two, what does the Bible have to say about tithing? A lot. And it doesn't put tithing in an optional category. The book of Leviticus says a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It's holy to the Lord. In other words, it doesn't say give if you feel like it give as you feel led, God says, excuse me, the tithe is already mine. Now, literally, the whole earth is God's, Psalms 24. Everything we have is a gift from God, and it's like God saying, I want to teach you that generosity is the law of my kingdom if you're a believer. It's the way life works. So I want you to regard that 10%, that tithe, not even as belonging to you, it's mine. And this gets reflected in the language the Bible uses about tithing. Notice from 2 Chronicles, God speaking to Israel. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks, a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and piled them up in heaps. Notice, it says they brought the tithe. It didn't say they gave the tithe. The same verb is used in Malachi bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be provision. So in the Bible, it talks about bringing the tithe, not giving the tithe. There's no accident about that language because I can't give something that doesn't belong to me. Last year, I had the privilege to drive a brand new Lamborghini, nearly $300,000. I was afraid to sit down in it, but I did. And I got to drive it for a while. Uh, at the end of my drive, I took it back to the owner. I did not say to the owner, I'm giving you this Lamborghini. As he would have looked at me like I was stupid and said, you ain't giving me anything. That's mine. No, I said, I'm bringing it back to you because it doesn't belong to me. That's simple, right? So they brought the tithe they gave offerings. They're two separate things. The tithe, that 10%, is God's. You bring that. You give as you feel led, as your heart feels generous, offerings. That's above the tithe. So he says, I want you to think about the tithe that way. So in the Bible, people give offerings when they give over and above the tithe but they bring the tithe to the storehouse. Cindy and I have always brought our tithe right here at Summit into our local church that we're part of because this is our spiritual family and home. And we give over and above the tithe, both to our church and then above the tithe if we have a guest speaker or we bought backpacks for 500 kids at almost elementary school. Uh, or we have a, we're gonna, the church is going to buy something or whatever, then that money is above our tithe. That didn't come out of the tithe. Tithe goes here. But we support other ministries, and we sowed into uh, Kong He, who was here from Singapore, and, and different events like many of you do. That's giving. That's giving. That's above the tithe and offering. But our tithe always goes right to the house of God where He's put us right here. So, uh, question number two. What if I'm unable to tithe? Now, that's a real interesting question. 
So for just a moment in your mind, put aside tithing and just think about giving. There's a Syracuse professor named Arthur Brooks, and he writes about how millions of Americans never give anything to any charity, nothing at all. When asked, why don't you give, the number one answer was, I can't afford to. I don't have enough money. And the corollary uh, to that is very often, of course, I am a generous person at heart. I would give more if I could just afford to give more. I'd give more money if I had more money. Ever heard that? I think all of us have heard that. Well, I'm going to be myth buster tonight and prove to you, ain't so. Now, here's what's interesting. The I can't afford to give reason is used mostly by upper income people than lower income people. Let that soak in. This is from a newspaper, the Chronicle, October the 7th last year. Among the nation's largest 50 metropolitan areas, San Francisco ranked not first, not second, not tenth, but 45th in charitable giving. The San Francisco Bay Area, which is the largest in the world and has produced more wealth than any other area in the history of the human race, gives a smaller percentage to charity than five total of other 50 metropolitan areas in the country. San Antonio was number 16 out of 50. Stacy Palmer is the editor, and he writes, rounding out the top 10 were cities in the southeast and Texas, the heart of the Bible Belt. Palmer was not sure why San Francisco ranks so poorly unless it's because there are fewer people connected to a church. And I want to say sarcastic, really, yeah, yeah. Cities in the Bible Belt are more uh, generous than in the San Francisco Bay Area, although it's this incredible generator, the Silicon Valley and all of wealth and leadership. One reason is a tradition of tithing in the Bible Belt has formed generous people, generous hearts, and generous hands where people are accustomed to giving. It's so interesting, the same article says, as a matter of statistical fact, on average, this is in America, on average, people with more money do not give more. They actually give less as their income rises. So here are some recent statistics, and I'll put them on the screen. People in our country who made less than $25,000 a year gave, on average, 7.7% of their income to charity. People who made between $25,000 and $50,000 a year gave away 4.6% to charity. People who made between $50,000 and $75,000 in a year gave away 3.5%. People who made between $75,000 and $100,000 gave 3%. People who made between $100,000 and $200,000 gave 2.6%. And people who made $200,000 and above, however many millions above that might be, gave only 2.8% of their income away because they couldn't afford to give more. That's shocking, isn't it? I mean, that is statistical fact. So if you've heard, well, if I made more, I'd give more. Well, Donald Duck, it ain't true. Now, there are exceptions to that, and I hope it's believers, but that's in general how the world works. So how does that happen? Let me give you an illustration. Think of a pie with slices in it for just a moment. If I approach my money saying, what are my expenses? I'll take care of them first. Here's what will happen. My life will just fill up with expenses. The more money I get, the more expenses I get, and they demand the bigger piece of the pie. The first piece of that pie for most folks will be a house. Is that a little slice of the pie or a big slice? Come on, that's a big slice. Massive. It's gone. I just gave that to my house. There's a lot of people that have kids. Do kids take up a big slice or a little slice? One friend of mine is paying $24,000 a year in daycare. Those greedy little guys, they are so expensive. Clothes and braces and sports then there's a car, and people like to have a nice car, and that costs money. Then there's health insurance. That costs money. Then there's eating. That costs money. I don't have time to fix food, so I go to a restaurant. That costs money. There are vacations, taking trips someplace. All of that costs money. 
And finally, what remains are leftovers. All I have to give to you, God, are leftovers. What my intent, nobody plans to be ungenerous. It's just that we do the leftover thing. This might be interesting to note because politicians have to post their tax returns online from the president on down. You can see what they paid in taxes and what they gave to charitable giving. If you want to look at a heart, look at the charitable giving, according to Jesus. Uh, okay. I was just thinking off the top of my head, we could do more. Maybe you can Google some more. Uh, it's not about your political affiliation. It's about your heart. Okay. Uh, I, I'm thinking of Carter. What's Carter's first name? Jimmy Carter gave over 10% of his income to charity, mostly to his church. Democrat Bill Clinton gives over 10% to charity and to his church. And in the recent tax returns between Bill and Hillary, they paid 43, I'd love to pay $43 million in taxes. Well, shoot, yeah, I would. What are you talking about? And when you look at the total income, they gave over 10% to charity. Uh, here's what I discovered. The ones that did, and there were some more, there was a Republican in there as well, maybe two Republicans and Democrats. Well, what was interesting, they all came from a Baptist background. And Baptists teach you to tithe. And all of them did very, very well. That was no coincidence. If you weren't raised that way, you'll see it. I mean, one presidential candidate only gave $800 in a whole year to charity. Think about that. You can Google this and find out for yourself, okay? I think that sucks. <laughs> You're going to care for the America, and you gave 800 bucks. Good grief. You need to get out in the road and let somebody run over you. You're pitiful, <laughs> stingy thing. Sorry. <laughs> See, God's plan for the human race is not the leftover thing. You're not being obedient to God until if you're doing the leftover thing. So neither tithing nor generosity will ever happen if I use the leftover approach to my money. This is where a real important principle comes to play. And it's associated closely with tithing. The Bible calls it first fruits. First. The Bible was written when people were an agrarian society. They didn't have currency. They had crops. They had agriculture. So the main financial asset was agriculture, livestock. And they would honor God right off the top. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits, which Leviticus says is the tithe, the first 10% of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing. In Exodus, it says, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Now, the idea here is that when I get paid, the first thing I do with my money, the first portion I set aside is not the mortgage company, it's the tithe. God, this is yours. Right off the top, it belongs to you. That's the first fruits principles. And if you go through the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Upon the first day of the week, they met in homes. Uh, God demands to be first. He wants his people to put him first. It's just undeniable. So God says right from the top. So the tithe is not just a tenth. Watch this. It's the first tenth of my income. If you were an Israeli and your cow just had a calf, you don't have a guarantee you're going to birth another one, but you've got to give the first one to the Lord as a means of trust and honor. And, of course, God says, if you'll trust me, I'll bless you. And then they would go out in the field, and the first tree, fruit trees that blossomed were the first that had fruit. They would tie a reed around it to mark it, knowing that's going to go to God first, not in my barn either for consumption or sale. That took more faith in that day than what we do today. So in Israel, people were so committed to this, farmers would go through their fields, they would mark the first trees that blossomed with fruit, 
and they would mark it and put it aside. This goes to God. I'm going to trust God's going to help me with the rest of my harvest. They tended to be more aware than we are. They were dependent on God to be alive. That was bigger faith for them than for the majority of you and I, but they'd do it. God, they said, I trust you so much with my first fruits that I'm tempted to hold back and clutch I'm giving to you. And God was saying to them, 90% of your income with my blessing is more than 100% of your income without my blessing. And it was the same thing if they had animals, firstborn of the flock. He says, the first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from the herd or from the flock. Not just 10% of them, the first 10%. The way this works for us is when I get paid, the very first check we write, for those of you under 25, a check was a little piece of paper you wrote on. I know all you smartphone guys do your little pay things and all, and you're really cool, but we, we paid our bills with checkbooks. I still do. And the first one I would write would be a check to God, our tithe to God. God, this is yours. Now, would you bless everything else that we have? And thank you so much for what you've given us. Now, why can't I make out my first check to the mortgage company? Well, here's a good reason. The mortgage company can't bless your finances. Nor did they promise to. Did you ever notice that? I've never had a call from American Express or Visa saying, hey, Rick, if you pay us first, we're going to pour out great blessing on your financial life. They kind of hope I'm late so they can add more interest and bless their financial life. And the reality is the, the best way to afford to tithe is just start to tithe. If you wait to tithe, whatever season you're in, there will always be a reason to wait. You know, the more money you'll bring in, the more your expenses will grow. There's always going to be a reason to delay. If you wait to tithe until you can afford to tithe, you'll never tithe. Here's the thing about money. Money's never about money. Money is always about trust. And I call this series, In God We Trust. Really? With a question mark. That's on the back of your dollar bill. See, it doesn't make any trust. It doesn't, get, it doesn't show any trust to give God what's left over. I don't pay my bills, and then if I have enough left over tithe, I give him the first portion. And that's what activates the miracle of God providing for you. And if you've never tried it, don't even open your mouth with an opinion. So I want to help you, like in marriage, so that you can get out of this struggle and always being the tail and not the head. Because it, God calls poverty a curse. If poverty was a blessing, we'd have revival in barrios and ghettos instead of murder, crime, rape, and drugs. It's not a blessing. It is a... I'm thinking of a nice word. It's a, it's a curse, which is what I felt like doing saying it. I just hear the stupidest things ever mentioned. How many of you would say, tonight, Brother Rick, we're going to have an altar call, and I want to pray for those of you that wish to be poor. Come right now. I shall pray the prayer of faith that God will remove everything from you so you can be homeless, have cardboard, and hope somebody feeds you and gives you a blanket. I wouldn't have anybody at this altar. So quit talking about poverty being good. It's not good. Jesus became poor that you through his poverty might be made wealthy. Not just spiritually, but so God could bless you with abundance. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to balance that in just a second. So give me a moment. Don't get ahead. So God was teaching Israel, we live and walk by faith. I want the firstborn. I want the first fruits, And I'll be faithful. Tithing will test your faith. And it will build your faith. It's a test and a faith builder. Number four, do I have to tithe on the net or the gross? Single most common question I ever get asked. Do you want God to bless the net or the gross? It actually relates to a larger question that comes up for folks who have been around church a long time. Hey, Rick, isn't tithing part of the Old Testament legalistic system of the law from which we have been freed by grace? Now, that's a really important question. So I want to camp on that one for just a few moments. In the first place, tithing was never intended by God to be some legalistic mean practice. It's always been about your heart, and it's always been about trust. Way back in the Old Testament, it says, give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. 
then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. It was always about the heart. And not just that, the principle of tithing goes way back before the Mosaic law. Some of you know Moses gave the law to Israel on Mount Sinai. But Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek 430 years before Moses was even born and before the law. Before the nation of Israel even existed, the tithe was the basic principle of human life with God. In fact, you can go all the way back before Abraham to Genesis. And a lot of you have heard the story about Cain and Abel. Do you know where all the trouble started? Genesis 4 says Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. Abel also brought an offering, but from the firstborn animals of his herd, choice cuts of meat. God liked Abel and his offerings, but Cain and his offering did not get his approval. So if you wonder why Cain, I mean why Abel was favored by God and Cain was not, it's that Abel did what God told him to do the way he said to do it. He brought the firstborn, the first fruits, the first portion, the choice cuts. God, it belongs to you. I'm going to give in faith, as you said, give in obedience. I want to trust you. Cain said, nope, I'll give you something, but it's leftovers. I'll give you what I want when I want. I'm in charge of my money. And then in the New Testament, Jesus endorses tithing as well. He was rebuking the Pharisees because they were so mean. They were neglecting the oppressed, justice, and mercy. But they were so nit picking legalistic, they tithed not only on their crops, but on spices. They didn't have to do that, but they did spices too. And Jesus said, these you should have done, but not leave justice and mercy undone. He commended it. So let me give you a law of hermeneutics, not even taught in seminary. At the cross, some things are abolished. At the cross, some things are changed from the natural to the spiritual. Number three, at the cross, some things come through unchanged. And here's the rule. If it changes or if it's abolished, the apostles have to tell me. I won't know. So, quick example. Circumcision in the Old Testament was of the flesh, skin. We know that we don't walk in the flesh, ain't talking about my skin. It's talking about the corruption of my heart. So he says, circumcision of the flesh profits nothing, Romans 2, but circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. It changed from physical circumcision to spiritual circumcision. And he tells me, he tells me. Um, some things come through unchanged. There are denominations that don't use musical instruments. These are good people. They mean well, but they're oh so wrong. And I notice most of them have an alternative service with musical instruments because they can't draw anybody singing a cappella. I thought, well, if it's good enough for your contemporary service, how come it ain't good enough for the old gray-haired people in there? Why don't you teach them the truth? You don't read anything in the New Testament about musical instruments or praise and worship. But the Old Testament is loaded with it. Praise Him with the harp. Praise Him with the tambourine. Praise Him with loud shouting. Praise, clap your hands, O ye people. Shout unto God. It's just loaded. Well, why is the New Testament silent? Because it comes through the cross unchanged. You don't want a Bible this big. So God said, I gave you everything you need to know right here. If anything changes, I will tell you. It didn't change. It comes through unchanged. So cool. Tithing was before the law, at the heart of creation in Genesis. So it comes right on through, and Jesus could have stopped everybody with these Pharisees and says, guys, are you still tithing? Forget that. We've changed policies now. But he didn't. He says, these you ought to have done. And then there's no more said about it, because he's given you every principle on it in the Old Covenant. It's before the law, and it comes through the cross unchanged. Simple, 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 easy to understand. But if it's abolished, then we know he's got to tell me. He's got to tell me. Okay so far?
Let me just give you something to wrap your head around. You can talk about it at lunch, okay? So in the New Testament, the ultimate expression of how generous God is, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Remember the first fruit principles? Paul says this about Jesus. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Jesus Christ is God's first fruit offering to the whole world. I can't imagine facing God one day saying, well, I know all the scriptures. I know what you did for people. I know how you provided for the widow. I know how I know I know. And I know I have the gift of eternal life. And I thank you that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. And I think I'll ratchet my giving down to about 5%. I don't know what's in people's mind. But the human tendency is greed, stinginess. The first words our little toddlers learn, there was two words, no and mine. There you go. And then when you're 65, you still hear it from me, mine, no. And say, God wants to get that out of you. Number five, what happens if I tithe? Real simple answer, you get blessed by God. You don't even have to be a Christian. When you obey a principle in Scripture, it works for you. Remember, this is not about going to heaven. So if I do what God says, even knowingly or unknowingly, I get the benefit. Friendly people who may not know Jesus Christ have lots of friends. So what does the Bible say? He who has many friends must show himself friendly. You're giving that friendship away. You're attracting, you're operating the law of God, and you don't even know God. And it still works. It's an an immutable principle. You can do what God says and get what God promises, and there are a lot of people who are not Christians who are incredibly generous, who have a good marriage. And then we have to pull our hair and sit in church forever to try to get people to be friendly, to be nice, to be generous, and it's like, this is crazy. You don't want to let some pagan live better than you when you are a child of the kingdom, and God has made these provisions to help you not hurt you, but bless you. So, God says, I want you to tithe, I want you to give, and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out so much blessing, all nations will call you blessed. Now, this is not a get-rich scheme. This is not how you get a, 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 a Lamborghini or uh, a 10,000 square foot home in Dominion. This is not. I realize there are people that have fraudulently taken Scripture out of context and built a manipulative system. Say, if you give $1,000 tonight, God has told me all of you will get a hundredfold in 60 days. You are a bald-faced liar. There's not a verse in the Bible that says that. And if God came down out of heaven, he'd slap you in the mouth saying, I didn't say any such of a thing. You said that to use witchcraft to make people do something they don't want to do. So God gives you principles, and then it's up to you to choose. You choose life. You choose the curse, the blessing. or You choose. So all I want to do is give you the material, and then you are responsible for what you do with it. So that's not what this is about. This is not about how to be self-centered and how to be wealthy. This is the way God provides all of your needs and then some. And based on your education, your skill, your, the, the, what God's purpose for you is, you will always have more than enough. Now, more than enough means just what it says, more than enough. It doesn't mean you will live in a dominion. It doesn't mean you'll have two Lamborghinis. Some will, some won't. But you'll have more than enough. Your family will be cared for. Education can be taken care of. You'll be able to honor God, the kingdom. You'll be able occasionally to help other people. You'll be a great blessing. God says, I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing to many nations, to Abraham. If Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, how are you going to do that if you're broker in the Ten Commandments? Tell me. If it's more blessed to to give than to receive. I want to be able to bless you. I want to be able to help people occasionally as I'm able. That's the whole point of it. We're like salt in a world of darkness. We want to give it flavor and zest and vitality. Don't you hate bland food? Well, that's what a bland Christian is like. He doesn't doesn't spice up anything. God wants you to spice up this dark world, this sad world. So this is the way generosity works in the kingdom of God. I've been blessed. I talked to a young guy in our church, and he's 
uh, telling me for young couples who want to buy a house, it's often tempting to think, I can't afford to tithe because there's going to be a gap between the house we want and the house we can afford. He said, that gap is so big for my wife and I, we realized we'd never be able to buy a house if God were not part of our financial life. And he said, I wish so much that young couples were on this adventure of tithing for their sake, for their sake. It's been part of my life since I was 18 years old, and it's been part of our lives since Cindy and I got married 41 years ago. Somebody was saying their mom and dad had very low-income jobs, but they watched their mom and dad set aside a tithe of their money every single week, and they said, I'm so grateful I grew up in a home that did that, and I was raised by a grandparents who did that every Saturday night, and here I am, an old rebellious teenager with not a spiritual ounce of motivation in me, and they drug me to church. And I'd watch every Saturday night my grandfather write that check out. I'd hear lawyers get up during January stewardship month and talk about their secretaries writing that first check to, to, to that particular church. It was a, a Baptist church downtown. And in the rock and roll business, I used to send my tithe home cash from the money. We'd get suitcases full of money. I wasn't real smart either. But, you know, when you're a teenager and you know everything, you don't care. But one thing I did, I'd sent, I, I did that since I was a pagan rock and roll entertainer. And I, God's always taken care of me, forever. It's quite an, I haven't been a nice person all that time, but I obeyed that principle, and God rewarded me for that principle. You couldn't talk me out of that if you tried to. I've lived it for most of my life. From 18 years of age to 71, holy cow, I know something, Kimasabi. If you hadn't even tried it, shut up. So when Jesus rose from the dead, it created a community of irrational joy and irrepressible generosity. People said, I just have to express my love and joy by being generous. That's what comes out of you when you hang around Jesus. We're the community of the resurrected. We know what we trust. We know who we trust. And it's ironic when it comes to money because money will beg you to trust it. That little phrase on the back of a dollar bill, in God we trust, is no accident. Because everything else on that dollar bill begs you, trust me, trust me, trust me. Right. Number six, what happens if I don't tithe? God says you're under a curse because you're robbing me. Now, that's a strong word. Uh, think of it this way. It's not a spell. Come on. It, behavior has consequences. When you clutch instead of give, you miss the blessings of generosity and joy, and you actually become more anxious and more self-preoccupied. It is no accident that the word miserable comes from the word miser. To be a miser is to live in misery. God says, you're under a curse. You're robbing me and you're robbing yourself of what I want to do for you. We've had so many miraculous interventions when it was beyond. See, you're thinking, well, I only make this much money. Or you're ruling out God intervening in your life to bless you through people, other opportunities that you know nothing about. You've shut the door on that possibility. Shoot, I'm not going to get anywhere on a fixed income. God's got to do some supernatural stuff that comes from outside, and that's what he promises to do for you. And I'm telling you, there are people on the threshold of a miracle. If you'll just begin to take what I'm saying to heart, and I'm going to give you a little challenge in a second. Number seven, this is the last. What if I hear all this stuff but really, deep down inside, I am very uncertain, very stressed, very anxious, and kind of freaked out about the whole idea of tithing. It scares me. Glad you asked. And here's where we close. This is what God says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. It's like God says, I know you're scared. I know you have doubts. But I am so determined that you become generous, not stingy. I will invite you to do something you are forbidden to do everywhere else in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture are we ever commanded or invited to test God. In fact, everywhere in Scripture it says, you shall not test the Lord your God. Jesus quotes the Old Testament in the New. Don't test God. Testing means I withhold my trust from you. I'm putting you on probation. It's presumption, and we're never to do that. But it's like God is saying here, I'm so determined you become a blessed and generous people. 
I will humble myself and like a late night infomercial, test me in this or your money back. See if I won't do what I told you I would do. And even more, I will pour you out so much blessing there won't be room enough to store it. And God says, go ahead, I give you permission here to test me. Nowhere else in Scripture does he allow you to do it. But right here, he does. And so I'm going to give you the tithe challenge. If you've never done that before, if you're scared, if you're skeptical, I understand So for the next 90 days, I challenge you, bring the full tithe, 10%, into the storehouse. And if in 90 days from now, you are not convinced that God will clearly sustain you and provide for you, then go back the way you were before. Nothing said, no questions asked. Some of you have never heard the tithing concept before. Maybe you're new to church life, but you need time to learn about it. Don't make a financial decision out of pressure, out of guilt, out of manipulation. Get some understanding about it. You can embark on the greatest adventure you've ever known and you've been missing. And you'll never have to be ashamed when you face the God who gave everything for you. Some of you don't know that you're on the threshold of the greatest adventure in your life when your money says you put God first. So that's the tithe challenge. And I want to urge you, don't be afraid to step out in faith and test God. You, you say, well, Rick, I did it for 90 days and I'm broker now than I've ever been. It's not going to happen. God says, test me in this. And if you can't believe God on a clear promise from clear scripture, then you better doubt he can take you to heaven. What else are you going to trust him for? I'm not in this game for, for religious nonsense. I'm, in, I'm living with purpose, right? I got heaven in the bag. I've been going to heaven since I was 27 years old. That's never been a doubt to me. But I want to learn how to do marriage. I've been married 41 years, and it takes God. I can tell you that. It ain't because of me. And, and, num- and, num- and, and financially as well. Uh, we, we ha- Cindy and I and, and many others, we've never had a raise in nine years. In fact, after the 08 crash, we lost benefits. Never came from that. And, and uh, the church doesn't pay for Cindy's car. I pay for that car. Gas, insurance, everything. The, I pay my own gas in my car. I've got a Volkswagen down there. I'm not living the high life off your money. I've been given more money. I'm at least in the top three givers in this church, and for two years, the number one giver. So I practice what I preach, and that's on a fixed income. And I'm trying to tell you, you can trust God. Okay? I want you to do well. I want to hear testimonies in the next 90 days that will make people's hair strand up. You know? If you got straight hair, it'll curl. And if it's curled, it'll go straight. I want to see what God's done. All nations will call you blessed. So this is something for you. 